Life Stories. Thank you so much, Alan, and welcome, Simon. You're looking very well, I must say. In fact, you're looking young enough to go back on Blue Peter. <laughs> now, you do realize, of course, you do realize, of course, that coming on here, you're really going to be famous from us. You won't be able to go to shopping. <laughs> well, welcome to um, our Zoom meeting and. Uh, as you know, on these meetings, we just talk to people about their lives and how God is uh, impacting their lives and just a bit about themselves, of course. I mean, we know everybody knows from reading Wikipedia right, about you that, you know, your life, you had broadcasting, very uh, good career. But tell us how it all began. I mean, what was your upbringing like and, you know, where you came from originally? So I, I grew up the son of a vicar. Um, my dad was a Church of England vicar. So we were we were a Norfolk based family for the first 10 years of life and then I headed down to Surrey, where dad took over a church there. And then I think TV wise, broadcasting wise, the, I, I, I watched Blue Peter as a kid, loved it. Just thought it was just a, an amazing program for the adventure. And I often used to sit there and think that would be an amazing program to work on. But I never ever thought at that stage that I'd one day end up working on it. But it was really at university. So I went to Birmingham University to study history, media studies as a course. There are hundreds of media studies courses out there now but back in 1992 there were very few so a little bit of advice from someone called Jeremy Vine whose family used to worship at my dad's church and he was in Radio 4 at the time of course now he's on Radio 2 and does lots of other stuff but he just said just get a degree and if you can get experience at university and broadcasting do that so we had an internal tv station at Birmingham University called Gill TV Nobody watched it. Literally nobody watched it. It was on in all the bars in the various uh, clubs in the Guild. And I started doing a programme on a Friday just called The Lunchbox. It was a fun magazine show, hour long with one other presenter. But the amazing thing was is that they, they'd got a lot of secondhand TV equipment from a studio down the road called Pebble Mill. Now, some of you of a certain generation will remember Pebble Mill. It's yep. where all the BBC's morning output used to come from. So over the years, they'd amassed all this secondhand equipment. So we had a proper studio, three cameras, and it got you used to what it's actually like to do live TV, to have someone chatting in your ear while you're talking. And yeah, no one's watching it. But actually, I caught the bug. And as I came to leave university, someone said, you know, you really should try this for a job. And so I came out of university and to cut a very long story short, but I, I aimed for Blue Peter and I gave myself three and a half years. I remember from a Christian point of view, a really vivid moment. I was back in Beckles where my parents were living at the time they'd moved from from Surrey to Suffolk and that was dad's last church before he retired and I remember one afternoon I was sat there thinking is, th is this just a dream that I'm gonna chase or is God in this and I always think as a Christian it's, it's always quite a good idea to involve God <laughs> in big decisions uh, so I prayed about it that afternoon and I sort of thought I'm just gonna be really bold and I said God just give me a sign that I'm not about to waste the next three years of my life chasing a dream that's never gonna come to fruition so I said my prayer and then a while later I went down to my dad's study at a desk a little bit like where I'm sat now and I was about to start writing letters on his computer to lots of different production companies to Blue Peter and other programs to try and get some work experience try and get a running job and I just noticed this magazine uh, and I think it was called the Alpha magazine but I don't think it was actually connected with what we now know as the Alpha course and on the front cover one of the sub headlines of the articles inside was why we need more Christians in the media I was like, goodness me. So I opened this magazine and it'd been actually written by a guy called Steve Chalk and Pam Rhodes, who was presenting on BBC Songs of Praise at the time. And it was like one of those moments where I don't know if you've sat in church or at a Christian event, wherever it might be when someone does a talk and you occasionally get those moments where it feels like that talk is just being aimed at you. And it was like this article had just been written to me and it was why we need more Christians in the mainstream media. It's okay having magazines and Christian radio stations, but we also need Christians in the mainstream media. And I just thought that's my answer. So for the next three years, I chased it down. I tried uh, applied for the job two times, got absolutely nowhere, got that letter that comes back, says, keep your details on file. Anybody who knows anything about TV knows that's a no, just a polite way of putting it. And then in 1999, um, through unfortunate circumstances for him, one of their presenters, Richard Bacon, got sacked in very famous circumstances. I remember it well, actually. Yeah, and, and there was an opening. And I thought, this is it. I'm going to give it one last roll of the dice. I'm going to try one final time. And, and after a long process of an interview and then eventually an audition, uh, I got the job. So that, that in a nutshell is how I went from being a little boy growing up in Norfolk to becoming Blue Peter's 27th presenter. 
I mean, you said yourself, you know, that Blue Peter was iconic and everybody wants to be on it and do things on it. I mean, did you ever dream when you were going to school and you were a kid that you would actually do it? No, 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 no. no. I just thought, I used to watch it and think that would be an amazing thing to do for a job, you know, to, to get paid, to, to travel the world, to try a lot of different experiences that people either pay very, very good money for or will never get the chance to do. And that was your daily life, you know, you never knowing from one week to the next. Yes, you knew what, when you were in the studio what the live shows were, but in terms of films, not never quite knowing what the next week was going to bring. And it could mean suddenly a, a trip abroad out of the blue. I remember getting to the end of a summer holiday a few years ago. I knew already I was going to Belize uh, to dive something called, called the Blue Hole. So I was very excited about that trip. You know, as going back to work in September goes, a trip to Belize isn't bad. And then literally... <laughs> A day later, as I was getting ready for this filming trip in, in 10 days' time, they said, look, there's a new film coming out made by Pixar called Finding Nemo. And it's all about this fish that lives on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And we want to do a whole film on it. So you're the only presenter who can dive. So would you mind going to Australia before you go to Belize? So two days later, you're getting on a plane to go and dive the Barrier Reef for three days. That, that is just, that's the dream job, which is why so many people wanted to do it. Very exciting. Um, before you landed the Blue Peter job, did you have a plan B? I mean, was there a, a career path uh, you had in mind that you wanted to be maybe an engineer or a, a teacher or something like that? That's a or very maybe, good question. Because, or maybe go into ministry after your uh, Yeah, I've, I've had that mentioned a few times, but I, I definitely think it's it's a calling, not not following the family mm -hmm. trade. So I haven't I haven't felt that call yet. Um, no, the honest answer is I didn't I didn't have a firm plan B. Um, so I've often wondered, well, what would life have looked like had that moment in 99 not come about? You know, the question of what would have happened is one in life that we can ask ourselves many times, because ultimately, as C.S. Lewis says in, in the Chronicles of Narnia, and Aslan used to say, the, the story of what would have happened has never, ever been told. So ultimately, I don't know. I mean, I worked in Selfridges for two years after coming out of university to pay the bills whilst trying to get media experience. I don't think I'd have ended up at Selfridges long term. Um, I mean, I nearly went for the police force, but uh, due to a dodgy knee, didn't get anywhere. So, George, the honest answer is I have no idea what I'd have done if this hadn't worked out. Life Stories. Four brothers and four sisters, and you can imagine the childhood as you grew up with such a big family. But there is a downside to it. You never really get close to your parents. All I ever, all I ever saw was my mum wash, iron and cook. And she had a, a job as well. I don't know how she did it, to be honest. Um, and she would say to us, wait, your father gets on. Oh boy, do we know what that meant. And he didn't want us, he didn't want to say that to you. And uh, so we ended up being quiet, quiet, quiet like mouses in the house, but out, outside in the, in the big outdoors. And the downside is I never got to know parental love, I never got to know them very well. And, uh, and basically, at night, um, you, you, you're, looking for, you're looking for acceptance, I, I found, and I didn't realise it, but that's what I was doing. Uh, 19 years of age, I met my first girlfriend, got her pregnant, and, and there's no way I could let her have a, have a child with her father, so I married uh, Jackie. And, um, but I didn't know how to love her. She was one of eight, one of eight. she had the same issue, didn't know, <laughs> didn't know what love was, and seen a lot of strife in the house. Anyway, we brought up our three children, and the early years were absolutely tremendous. I, I spent a lot of time with my children, but at the age of 12, each of them, you know, as they go into the bigger schools, each of them found it cool for Dad to be in their lives and, and wanted more space to themselves. I ended up feeling lost, lonely, not wanted, rejected. And I, I had five years of that. It was the hardest five years of my life. And then I was asked to go on a business trip by, uh, to California. Um, I went, and I ended up going to church for the first time since I was 15, I was 42 years of age, 27 years. And uh, I heard the true message that, that God had sent his son Jesus to die for my sins. And that was the moment I realised that I was a sinner. And I'd done a lot of things wrong in life, and I needed to get right with God. Yeah, I, I was sorry for the things I'd done, but I hadn't repented. I hadn't said, Lord, forgive me and, and help me with this. This was a moment where I said, I'm sorry, Lord, for all I've ever done in my life. Things I should have done that I didn't do, things I did that I shouldn't have done, that I thought a lot. And I asked Jesus to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. At that moment, my life was changed. The Bible says, uh, God is the old, you're a new creation. But my thinking pattern totally changed. I couldn't wait to get back to Wales to tell my wife how much I was sorry and that I loved her. You know, within, 
within six weeks, my wife says, I wonder if Jesus dead as King of Hero. My children over over an 18 month period all said, Dad, I wonder if Jesus has changed you. Jesus came into our lives to change our lives, to make our lives better. You know, he became not only my savior, but I wanted to make him more in my life that I could follow him because he knew there was a better a better plan for Des Duffy. Life began to change dramatically. We still, I still have issues, I still have problems, you know. I still get punches in the tire and have to get to work on time. These things happen to everybody. But God is there. He brings a peace. He brings a patience. He brings a love to situations. And um, I'm so I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased now that all the children have, uh, have grown up. And, and they too now are following the, the Lord Jesus Christ. You now they walk as they walk. And, and Dad has learned just to be there as a guide. Uh, and, uh, anyway, I pray you're blessed with this message. God bless you. Hi guys, my name's Gavin, I'm from Bethel Community Church, Canfergill and my stake. Yeah, growing up I was good at sports, I was good at rugby, I was good at football, I played for the school team, I played for the local team, I played for the district. I had Welsh trials on many occasions in football and rugby. I was the fastest bomber my year, I, I run for Wales and gained Welsh fest on many occasions. Growing up I had a lot of friends, but I never felt good enough, I never felt like I fitted in, I never felt like I belonged, I was very quiet and around the age of 17 I was diagnosed with manic depression and it was around about this time I started to drink and I was unpredictable, I'd either try and self-harm or I'd try and kill myself and one time I put my head through a church window and shortly after this I was introduced to ecstasy and speed by friends and to marzipan by the doctor and yeah these things started giving me confidence i i felt alive i felt at peace but uh it was at a cost and yeah with many years of psychosis at 19 i was put under the mental health act and at now 20 i was on antipsychotics i tried heroin for the first time and while all this was going on i managed to get a national national diploma at 21 and by 22 i was in university doing a dance degree and and in this time i ended up getting raped i ended up getting robbed and I was put on the home treatment team instead of getting sectioned and yeah I was so broken, I was so lost and I felt so hopeless and helpless and at 24 I got married and yeah the brokenness and the pain that I felt inside I, I didn't know how to talk about it, I didn't know how to express myself and at 29 I got kicked out of my house and I found myself in rehab, I went to a place called Patel and I encountered Jesus for the first time and yeah, I come in contact with the cross and it was the cross that really changed everything. It was the power of his blood, it was the power of the resurrection that he was risen and that I could rise and that you could rise. And I remember being out on a field at three o'clock in the morning just crying, just so broken, just so lost. And yeah, he just encountered me with his love and he set me free. Jesus has set me free. And yeah, today my life looks so much different. And yeah, I got joy, I got peace, and I got love, and at 17, I was told I would never be able to work, I wouldn't be able to drive, I'd probably always be on medication, but today, I'm working, today, I'm driving, today, I'm off medication, totally drug-free, totally in my right mind. No matter what you are facing, no matter what you are going through, no matter what has happened in the past, you know, Jesus, can set you free. Jesus is the way. Jesus can do it. If he's done it for me, he can do it for you. If you've been impacted by my story, click the link below. When your dreams are crushed, all hope is fading. Just believe in one who's never changing.
always with me by my side ever faithful right on time this now my destiny disappointment follows me and peace I'm Blue Peter and uh, you've landed the iconic show. How did you actually feel when you got the words that you've got the job? Uh, without doubt, the most exciting but surreal moment ever in, in life. So I'm not sure there's some people watching this from, from elsewhere who probably think, what well, I don't understand this program at all. But it's, it's been on air for 60 years and it's, it's, uh, it's an iconic, as you mentioned, BBC show. And when you get the job, I remember walking out as she was the head of children's at the BBC at the time. And this appointment was really important because of what had happened to Richard Bacon. There was always going to be a lot of media interest in who was going to replace the guy who's got sacked for taking cocaine. And they wanted to get it right. So it was a very long process. But I remember that night and she cracked open a bottle of champagne. I had a, a glass of champagne with her and the editor of the programme. And then... I was told you can't tell anybody for the next three weeks because we want to try and protect you and your family. So just please only tell your close family. But as I walked out her office, there on the wall is all the pictures of the 26 previous presenters. And he kind of looked at it and thought, I've just joined the most exclusive club in the land. I'm the 27th member. There's never been any more than 27. Uh, and that's, that's just a really surreal moment. I remember standing at... Um, at the tube station in Wood Lane, just outside the BBC, and thinking, I can't really tell anybody, but this is going to change my life. It really is going to change everything. And it was, yeah, without doubt, the most surreal and exciting moment of life thus far. Did you think at that point, wow, I've made it, I've made the BBC? Yeah, I did a little bit. I remember sort of looking as I walked out of Television Centre, um, as it was then, obviously it's, it's changed now, but um, just looking behind me and on the side of, it's a very famous logo that people had seen on the side of the building, which is Studio One, this huge studio where I did my audition, and just seeing BBC Television Centre, as I sort of looked back and thought, Crocky, that's now my office, that's where I'm going to be working. And, you know, for so long, it felt like those gates would never be prized open. That I'd never be someone walking in with the the lanyard and the and the and the little pass that says BBC with with your photo on it, which a lot of people, if I'm honest, used to wear with great pride on the tube, just to let everyone know sitting around them that they work for the BBC. But yes, it was a a magnificent moment to think, crikey, I've just become a, a BBC presenter. Now you got the job, okay? You're the new kid on the block, and 
how did the other presenters um you know welcome you when you came along i think looking back on it not just for the presenters but for everyone working in the show it was quite a strange time i think everybody knew that really the BBC had no choice but to terminate Richard Bacon's contract. Mm -hmm. you know, but he was a very, very popular presenter, not just with the viewers, but also with the people who worked on the show, the other presenters and the production staff, a really popular figure. He's a, he's a really, he's a, he's a fun character. He's, he's great company. I've met him you know, many times down the years. So th there was, because this was probably, I, I got the job probably about a month and a half after he'd gone. Um, and there was, there was a little bit of a sense in which people were still kind of mourning his loss, you know, they, they didn't really want to be having to welcome a new presenter in. But here I was, I've just been given this amazing opportunity. And I think for a time, I'm not saying people were unfriendly, they were, but I could I could really sense that there was there was still a lot of people upset by what had happened to Richard. And it weren't quite in the place yet where they were ready to sort of welcome with huge open arms a new presenter but they knew they needed one because it, the show's on air three times a week you're making films every week you, you know it's too much work for three of them so i think the presenters were relieved i've arrived because i'll take on some of the work but the production stuff and they they took a little bit of time to warm up to me which which was difficult because you know it's one of those sliding doors moments in life isn't it you've been given an opportunity by what's happened and, and you've got to take it you're never going to say no but it was a, it was an unusual time to get it now you've joined the program, of course, and uh, we only ever see the finished pro um, process on telly and TV. You all look great. You're all great and friendly. Was there ever any tension behind the scenes where, like, I think I should be doing such and such or, you know, I should have that job. Uh, I'm better at that and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, listen, there's always a little bit of that because, you know, something I was always always determined to do, and that was not let a job like that change me as a person. I didn't want to be seduced by fame or or any of the trappings that come with with doing a very public job so that kind of side didn't interest me and i i it meant a lot to me when people said you you haven't changed at all you know between when you joined the show and when you left you're still the same simon so i always felt it was really important to treat everybody as, as your equal whether they're the camera person the sound man whoever it is we're a team we i always used to describe us like we're like a football team the presenters are the finishers they're the strikers they're the ones who like in a game of football get the glory but without all the men behind them in a, in a football team you're nothing and it was the same for us so i was always really conscious of of being appreciative of, of being in a team um but you know there, yeah, there's always going to be there's always going to be little stressful moments they don't they'd often come on summer trips because you'd be away filming for five weeks in some really amazing locations but five weeks filming in india which is just incredibly hot and humid and you're on the go pretty much every day you don't really get any days off uh, you know when when people get tired then then people get a bit a bit upset with each other i remember going on a trip to san francisco uh, and Matt Baker, who I worked with for many years, it was me and Matt doing San Francisco and, and we did a few independent films and then we did some filming together. And there was one iconic shot in this film, which was Matt and I driving a red Corvette wow. uh, soft top with the roof down over the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, just an amazing moment. And Richard, the director said, Simon's going to be driving. And I only heard later on, because he didn't say this in front of me, that Matt wasn't very happy that he wasn't driving. You know, it's a bit of male testosterone, a bit of egos going on. So he wanted to drive. But yeah, you, you listen, when there's a team of four of you, you're always going to get moments like that. But I think the reason why the period I was on, it was so such a good time to be part of the show because we were genuinely friends. You know, we weren't, we didn't just put it on for the for the cameras at five o'clock on a Monday afternoon. We we socialised together uh, and are still friends to this day. Now you mentioned earlier about your dad, of course, with the vicar, and uh, hmm. somebody mentioned to you about they need more Christians in media. When you went into the job, did you have that in your mind as well uh, to be a Christian in the media to bring them the, the gospel message with you? Yes, that's a good. It's a good question because that. That I found quite difficult at first because, because there was an awful lot of publicity about me getting the job because of what had come before. I think the media made a lot of the fact that I was a vicar's son and also that I was a Christian because they're looking at it and going, you couldn't get a, a safer bet than going for a vicar's son. Little do they know about many other vicar's sons who haven't gone the same way, but they, they kind of, they, they painted me as this kind of Christian goody two shoes, you know, not going to make the same mistake as Richard Bacon. And I, I did feel quite a lot of expectation from the UK Christian world because I, you 
get so many emails and letters and requests to visit churches or visit big youth events and you know and people saying we're praying for you regularly and all those kind of things which was lovely but i'd always be you know and some people would write as directly as to say we really look forward to you sharing your faith on 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 blue peter now there were one or two films i did where i did speak about my faith because it fitted in with what we were doing but you know how how do you share your faith on a tv program you can't sort of come on air at five o'clock on a wednesday afternoon and go good afternoon everyone welcome to blue peter and just while we're here let me just tell you god loves you and he's died for you and he's forgiven your sins amen right later on the program we've got to make you know you can't you'd lose your job so it was quite hard that kind of expectation that 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 suddenly we've we've got this christian on on a high profile show and lots has been talked about him in the press about the fact he's a christian that i felt i did feel a lot of pressure actually that that i was supposed to use this position but actually i felt being a christian was more about as it always should be about your actions and your words and, and how you conduct yourself not whether you open your mouth live on the television and, and and declare god's forgiveness for everybody and how did you actually cope with that pressure at the time um i think i just got better at knowing what to say yes to and what to say no to you you kind of feel oh, i need to go and do that and i i I've, there was definitely a period george where i felt i felt i was just you know it, it was another Christian event I was going to that weekend or the next week. And 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 I thought people eventually, they're gonna get bored of hearing, you know, of Simon Thomas always popping up at any particularly youth event. So I became much better at going, that's really worth doing. But actually these others, you know, just for my own well-being and actually to manage my time and to have actually some time to yourself, you know, in a show that demands so much of you. Uh, I just became good at kind of filtering out what was worth doing and no offense to them, but wasn't you know, wasn't so worth doing. Um, yeah. Life Stories Life Stories